Ou pas te faire boire caillement pour me servir étranger. Hi folks, this is Ezeli Danta and I am, it's been a long day, but I'm going to just record this for Sarah Westhall for the United for Free Speech group. So um, this is the second act. I want to thank Sarah for inviting me. I want to thank all of you who actually donated and saw the first one that I contributed to. And now this one. So, yes, thank you folks for um, supporting this conference. My name is Esli Delta, and I am putting this together for Sarah Westhall and the guys, um, you guys over here at the United for Free Speech Conference. This is for Act Two. The United States has the largest embassy in the Western Hemisphere in IT. I, I, I want to tell you about that because the standard narrative is that the U.S. had no strategic interest in IT, and um, it's just there for humanitarian reasons, and we're just this failed state that keep failing, and, uh, you know, they have clean hands. I'm going to talk about um, the large footprint the United States has in IT and how you probably don't know about that. I'm going to talk about the people they have sanctioned and how, you know, what can we do? What can we do? I guess that's the thing, you know, everybody really knows, you know, the U S is a big bully and, um, we are the most helpless people in the Western hemisphere. We has no military racism makes it easy to sh say we're savages almost eating each other let me talk about that a little bit and um then i think i'm gonna have one of my young guys from one of my chat rooms talk to you about how hard it is for us to develop economically and why um just talk to you guys about maybe some things that you don't know like for instance that you might not know based on all the confusion of the mainstream media is um the president of IET was assassinated by U.S. aligned mercenaries after he started to shift Haiti into an alliance with Turkey and Russia. Within a month after he accepted the credentials of the Russian ambassador, who was also the same Russian ambassador to Venezuela, he was murdered on July 7th, 2021. The U.S who is involved, who has informants and mercenaries, Colombian mercenaries trained by U.S. Special Forces, 18 of them are in Haiti prisons. And the most important thing about all of this is that they say that they entered the operation because they were sure that the United States was involved. Yeah, and that will be it. And I hope that this is a successful event. <laughs> All right, for those of you who don't know, um, I run the Free Haiti Movement, and uh, you know, you guys can find me on social media. But what we really do is the non colonial narrative on IHC. So um, it's not hate, T, it's IT. And, you know, I was raised with. Haiti and um, and I'm, I'm, I'm I, even I have problems um, 
with the colonial narrative. But so when you hear me talk about IET, you, you know that I'm talking about the indigenous name for the nation and not the one the United States gave it when it came to um, colonize us in 1915 doing the first um doing the first uh, occupation. The U.S., I used to say it's the fourth largest embassy, but now I'm not even sure what it is because I, I, I looked it up before I even came here and I saw Armenia has a large embassy now, right? It used to be Iraq, Germany, um, China. Actually, the U.S. embassy in IHC is as big as the embassy they have in China. I think it's like 10 acres. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't found any information in it, but I know that it's not a military. It's not a embassy. It's a military base between Cuba and Venezuela. It's a place the United States has um, to survey what Russia is doing in these uh, Atlantic waters. Um, yeah, that's what it is, a military base. And the reason why the United States, okay, so for years and years and years, you, you know, we, we covered this in the first half. The U.S. essentially, you know, hates the fact that IT was the land of the brave and the free. We're the ones that got rid of slavery and so on. Um, and their idea of that is a black nation has to give its resources. We live to supposedly give our resources and everything to the United States. And the way um, I have a young man is going to be talking to us. So Hans Jean, and he's going to tell you his experience with the economic development, you know, so, you know. But what am I going to say to you? Okay, so the U.S. has its largest embassy in the Western Hemisphere in IT. That's what it has. And uh, <clears throat> private military contractors go do whatever they want to us. They brought us cholera. They brought us biological, uh, all sorts of biological eugenics. And we can't really do much. We don't have an army. We don't have media. We don't have a military. But I think things are going to be changing. You know, like I notice, of course, everybody's watching the expansion of BRICS. The uh, China. China brought peace to the Middle East. Can you imagine? My whole life, the United States has been saying, I'm going to be bring peace to the Middle East. China just did it. In essence, really, with Saudi Arabia and Iran um, negotiating that agreement. And uh, Iran, who was backing Yemen, um, they just they just stopped that, that war or have a ceasefire. And we hope that continues. All right. So. So things are changing. The Bretton Woods organizations are being um, challenged by these new alliances that China and Russia, who were apart from the Western powers, um, that were their allies after World War II. So what does that do for IT? You know, we're the least of the least. I don't know. I don't know. I know. Um, I hope that the United States doesn't decide to go to a nuclear war or a biological war with Russia and China, because all of us will suffer. Um, there's not much I can do about that. You know, Americans seems to have sort of like left everything to the duopoly. And uh, meanwhile, the five major technological fintech uh Organizations are investing in the BRICS nations, whether it's Zuckerberg, whether it's Bill Gates or 
um, Elon Musk or Apple or Google. They all have invested in these nations, you know, India, China, and um, we wonder what's going to happen. I have no idea, but I do know that um, the time has come. Haitians can't take it anymore. And um, if, I don't know, I can't tell you, but I know the United States wants a solution. They can have the three as the lead out points for a new world. And that's about it. I don't really have too much to say, except to say that um, in addition to the fact that the U.S. uses us as cannon fodder, and I guess it makes them feel good pummeling a helpless people. Um, they have sanctioned their own puppets. They have sanctioned um, Bijou, Gilbert Bijou, who owns the steel and lumber company in IIT that exports like billions, you know, in steel and lumber from IIT. They've uh, sanctioned him for, he's the billionaire of the Caribbean. He has a house, like we said the last time in Act One in Indian Creek, Florida. I guess the only thing I can see us doing, you know, as a lawyer is finding the resources to use all these sanctioned people and get an investigator down there in Haiti for all the people that are dying and bring some sort of class action suit and have these deep pockets who have their properties in the United States and Canada, like Wony Celestin, um, Matéli, who's in the United States, a U.S. citizens that 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 Bill Cl Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and um, Obama put in as our president, and now they are sanctioning him for financing gangs and um, yeah. If we had resources, that's all I can say. We don't have those resources. So these sanctions mean nothing because the United States plays both roles, right? Hero, villain. They created these men, these corrupt guys, you know, gave them all kinds of privileges. Um, they own the Arabs, Syrians and Lebanese and the Israelis. They are, they own the ports in IT. We're worse than what apartheid was in South Africa. It's just this minority white group of people, less than you know, 10 families who are the billionaires of the Caribbean and they control all the economic doors in IT. It's horrendous for us. When the news report about them being sanctioned, They'll put a, they'll say Canada sanctions three businessmen and they don't want you to know they're white because the face of crime is black in IAT. So you, you won't see their faces. Uh, Deeb, Gilbert Bijou, and what's the other one? I'll, I'll put it up. Right? That, so just... Look at that. When they when they show you who they're sanctioning, they'll show you a picture of a Haitian burning a tire, a black Haitian. So the racism that the United States and its overseers in IT, it's horrific for us because the media acts like it doesn't see it. So U.S. mercenaries can come to IT and the U.S. ambassador will release him, them. They could bring in illegal weapons from from Florida, uh, Port Lafito, which is owned by B Gilbert Bijo, the richest man in the Caribbean. He lives right there in Indian Creek. And uh, nothing happens to him because they're going to sanction him as opposed to putting out a warrant for his arrest for financing killers. Um, but that's what we're living in. That's where we are. Um, but my people are very strong. You know, they're going to continue to try to survive, but it's horrendous. Um, 
So you have um, Michelle Matili is sanctioned, uh, the former Obama installed, Clinton and Bill Clinton and, and Hillary Clinton installed uh, president for financing gangs. And so is his um, brother-in-law, Charles Remy, Kiko. Uh, they're all into drugs, you know, bringing it in from... Um, Colombia using Haiti as a transshipment center. And then, you know, the DEA is probably the biggest of all drug dealers. Um, they take their cut and then they go feed it to my children in the in the United States and feed the black men into the um, prison industrial complex so they can work for free for uh, AT&T. This is the world we live in. And I frankly don't know what to say other than that. Um, um, it would be nice to have some allies. I know what I would do with those sections if I had resources as a lawyer. Um, I definitely put a lien on all their businesses um, of the ones that have been sanctioned, like Bijou, like Matili, like um, the Haitian oligarchy, and then um, go after them, the deep pocket. The ports would belong to Haitians when we're finished. That's kind of my dream. You know, and it would be nice to get some help to get that done. Um, I see Haiti, as I've always said, um, we can be neutral in this geopolitical fight with BRICS and um, <laughs> the United States. You know, Saudi Arabia is gone with, uh, or has applied to to BRICS. That was a linchpin of U.S. Middle Eastern policy. What are they going to do? Um, I think the United States is just going to continue to do what it does. But if you look at the robber barons, um, Elon Musk got a big factory out there in China. Um, Bill Gates is out there in India and so forth. They're making their money in these BRICS nations. I think they're going to have something to say about whether there is going to be a war. Uh, I think at the end of the day, if we don't all get together and take over the narrative, they're going to keep selling the regular folks with all kinds of economic elite trash while they inflate the dollar and take away all our resources and let AI rule. I'm hoping that the people in this conference are going to be those difference. It'll be the difference for the next generation, um, and for the those who are here um, for this generate for, for 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 the people who are here now, um, partaking in this or immorality and bullying and imperialism, and um, of the U.S. And then for those who are who want to do something different. The president of Haiti was assassinated by U.S. aligned mercenaries. You can find all this information on New York Times and the information we gave out in the first act, but it's all over in New York Times. So what does the United States do, do since then? They deflect the assassination accusation by essentially right now sanctioning oligarchs, the Arab uh, Syrian and Israelis who actually are the overseers, the white minority structure that controls all of the elements of nationhood, the economic doors, the consulates, diplomatic pouches they have, the, the, the in, import export. These oligarchs are kept in power by the United, the United States. Um, the U.S. has sanctioned many of these oligarchs in the last um, year since the since July seventh, twenty twenty one, that it keeps in power. It's, it has sanctioned them along with Canada and the U.N. with financing the gangs that are uh, unleashed upon Haiti for the U.S. and Kissinger type depopulation agenda. 
So it's not enough that they give us all their drugs uh, for infertility. They have, th this is what they have in Jamaica. They've had in Jamaica since the 70s. It's just normalized behavior for the northerners. But in Haiti, it wasn't. Our, 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 our um, violence rate was, was 5.7 in 2004 when the UN came in. And now it's double that. And, and every day it's getting worse for Haitians. So they have sanctioned oligarchs um, that they keep in power with financing the gangs that are doing the violence instead of putting the, a warrant out for their arrest. The U.S. deflects assassination and destabilization accusation by condemning truth tellers like us at the Free Haiti Movement um, with um, Cold War tactics. Um, they, they haven't actually reached us yet, but we've seen what they're doing to uh, Pan-Africanists and anti-colonial voices in France, like Kimi Seba and Natalie um, Yam. So they essentially have started to make noises that the Wagner group and the Russian Wagner group is in IHC. And this is how they censor um, voices that are anti-colonial and that points to the U.S. hands in what's going on in IHC. So the establishment elites accuse um, anti-colonial fighters of um, being with uh, terrorists when they are in fact the terrorists. Hi Hans, thank you so very much for coming and, and, and sharing your experience with the United for Free Speech people. I really do appreciate it. Um, people, this is um, Hans Jean, or Jean, who is from IT, uh, a young Haitian who tried to do a business. And, and, and he's going to tell you about a couple of points of what happened to him. You don't want to continue to send remittances to your to your cousins and your family. You want them to be self-sufficient, to start building some wealth. Tell us about your experience in IT. Huh. All right, thank you, Azili. Uh, as Azili said, my name is Hans Jean, and I was born in Kafu in Haiti. And um, I was there for seven years, and I came here in 1999 after my grandmother had died. And I've been here with my father for most of my time. And um, I went to Haiti in 2015 and also in 2021. But before I go into that, I'll speak a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and um, I also was in the military for a short amount of time for about six years. Right now I'm currently in the inactive ready reserve. And one of my dreams was to start a business for my family and since i've been in this country you know there's been a, a lot of struggles but i have learned to overcome everything and and i've always sent money to my family as most people in the haitian josh squad does but i figured that um it would come a time once i have my family that i would not be able to continue doing that you know and i had to start figuring out some ways to bring additional income for them and um that's when i started brainstorming about different ways that i can i can start doing that so haiti is haiti has a problem with uh with uh, getting proper electricity you know and this is a problem that i don't see going away anytime soon because you know there's certain individuals in haiti that just does not want Haiti to have power because if Haiti has power, you know, Haiti will start, you know, evolving like many other countries. When you say so, individuals, what does that mean to you? You know, um, the more I I started like researching the, the business of uh, generators and my cousin explaining to me about the, the power sh issue in, in Haiti, that's when I figure out that um, certain individuals have a monopoly in Haiti. And the profit comes from the instability and underdevelopment of Haiti. 
and and there's no way around it because some of them work with the with the government in Haiti to keep it the way it is, and they also do a, uh, this thing where like they don't want the Haitian diaspora to come to Haiti at uh, for competition, you know, and that can be deadly. Right. If you're too big. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Yeah. So, like for instance, like how do they? How do they work to keep the electricity from, you know, different areas? Uh, you know, how do they work to keep this monopoly? Do they have a contract from the government or they, did they just kind of, um, you know, what was your experience? Is there a particular family, you don't have to say their name, that controls the the fuel, the electricity? Um, so what I did was, um, I know in Haiti, there's a thing called Comes where people buy, you know, uh, materials or products and resell it. So I went on um, the Facebook marketplace and I was speaking to a couple of people that sell the uh, generators. And I was like, hey, um, where are you buying these generators from? And they told me that they buy it from the from the Honda, Honda uh, family. And they're the owner of MSC Plus, which is like a big store which is equivalent to home depot you know okay. and i sent i sent them an email and i was like hey my name is hans Jean. i live in america and i'm looking for ways that i can purchase generators and resell them and eventually start my own store and um they just asked me you know like um who are my connections um they asked for my last name and then um they asked me um does anyone in my family have businesses in Haiti. And I was like, um, my well, I did tell him my last name. You know, I was like, right, my name is right, right. Yeah. You know, and I didn't like the way that they they was responding to me. You know, there was like um, there was like, first of all, first, first of all, they told me they was like, uh, we don't know who you are. Um, you don't have any like footprint in Haiti. And there was like, um, you don't even have experience. There were, and then that's when I was like, well. I was like, I don't have to buy from you. I can just buy from China. And it seemed like they just didn't want my business being out. Yeah. And, you know, before I even ordered uh, the generators and I spoke to my manufacturer in um, China, I was speaking to my landlord and I was like, hey, you know, I'm trying to start a business in Haiti so my family can have um, an income where they can work for, for themselves. I was like, but I, I have an issue of uh, trying to, get this thing in customs when I do eventually do it. He was like, oh, my um cousin works for uh the customs of Porter Prince. He was like, um, you don't have to worry about being strong armed or <laughs> having to pay ridiculous fees. But here's the thing, you know, when you buy things overseas, you have to mm-hmm. um get a fry for order. So, and it's so crazy because I hired this fry forwarding company and I didn't know at the time, but the owner of that company also worked for MS, MSC Plus. So pretty much they worked with the um, manufacturer in um, China to uh, ship it to Miami and then eventually bring it to Haiti. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So at the time, they didn't know that I knew, well, they didn't know that I had connections with the with the director in uh, Port-au-Prince for um, customs. And they were trying to charge me like a ridiculous fee to remove my um, my uh, generators from customs. And I was like, hey, I don't have to pay this fee. Like I can just get someone else to pay me what I, to make me pay what I'm supposed to pay. It was like, it was like this is impossible. It was like, this is Haiti you pay what they say you're going to pay. I was like, so who's this person that's saying I'm going to have to pay this, um, this certain amount? Good for it you. Was like, and and you, you told me that you stopped working, excuse me, you stopped trying to scale up because of all of the insecurities, yes? Correct. When I, when the kidnapping started rising and then the death of uh, Jovenel Moise, I, I stopped completely. Wow. You know, it just wasn't worth it at, at that point. Um, so I told my family that I'm, I'm just going to like pause the business until things get better and they haven't got, got, got any better. Never gotten better. Something's going to have to give. 
because I don't think that Haitians are going to continue to look at these Arabs and let them be our overseer forever and control all the economic doors, all the consulates, all the shipping lines that come into IT. You know, I'm not going to work 35 years in America and keep sending remittances to IT and nothing changes. Because exactly. who, who is using those remittances, right? When you send money, right, to your cousins, all right, what are they buying things? They're buying food. They're buying all of that you need to live, right? From, from, right. from toothpaste to, 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 who are they buying it from? From them, because they're the ones that got the- uh, Exactly. Uh, so corner. you're funding the oligarchs. Are you going to keep doing that? <laughs> you see, you're funding them. Yes. Instead of funding your cousins to be self-sufficient. I'll say one thing, though. Um, when I was speaking to the director of, of the Duan and Port-au-Prince, okay, he didn't mention- know what the Duan is. What is that? Customs. Yeah, Cause customs. Cause oh, customs, yes. Um, he did tell me one thing that um, he can't protect me all the time. So he told me that eventually when I start doing big orders, you know, um, people are going to know, like, where the, where's this coming from, you know? Um, he said that there's like an entity in Haiti, and if you use enough common sense, you, you already know who, who they are. Whenever you order like a huge amount of huge amount of products for commercial reasons, um, certain individuals and customs um, bring that information to them, so they know who who the competitors are. And even though he he's, he's at a very high position, he he doesn't control everyone that works in in the duan. So there can be like lower employees uh below him that bring information to uh the oligarchs and right then and there you know they know who who is bringing these things in because when you have a a bill of, a bill of uh lading which is uh a document that explains everything that you're bringing into customs it has your name your information um um, who purchased it, where, who's coming to pick it up. So when I purchase my stuff, my, my, my name is on there and, and I put a person who's, who's going to come pick it up, which is my cousin. So his address, his number is on, is on there. You know, anyone can just copy that document and give it to whoever they, they feel like it. And then that becomes a, a, a big issue as far as like a security. And that's what, your friend at custom told you that if you scaled up, you're going to bring attention to yourself and, and they don't, and you know, right. Get, right. Uh, people in the diaspora are getting killed just doing business. Right. So Cause told, they get rid of their business competitors. Yeah. So he told me, you know, just keep it simple by like five, every six months or like 10. Wow. Yeah. Don't don't scale up too too much because you're just gonna bring more attention to yourself. And all I all I'm thinking is like uh this 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 is not the plan, you know? This is not the plan. <laughs> you know, they can threaten you um as far as like um like sending like uh their gangs to to try to like uh shoot at you or burn down your business you know it's it's like a whole bunch of different tactics tactics that they use to make sure that you can't prosper right and you were also mentioned that um you were even afraid to advertise that you were selling these things because you were afraid of people knowing where your cousins live Yes, because um, there's been a a huge increase in um kidnappings by these gangs called uh uh G nine, Sengsercon, you know, um, you know, and you have to really be careful because these these people do not play, you know, and they ask for like three four hundred thousand dollars, which I do not have, right, and and you have to really think about this stuff before you start selling stuff in uh, stuff in Haiti. And I had and to get. You, said you you stop right right after Jovenel's 
So you, you, you mm -hmm. actually made a profit with what you actually, um, imported, right? Correct. Um, and, but you were also mentioning to me that even though you made almost double, um, what your cost was, uh, on a relative level, the, the Haitian, uh, oligarchs are selling that same unit for much more. $1,900. Wow. And you sold and it for? I sold it for like $1,500. Like $400 more, uh, the more they're selling it, right? So they would think you're competition if you had scaled up. But imagine the type of money that they have. The more, gener the more gen gen generators that you purchase at wholesale prices, the cheaper it is. Exactly. So they have a... So they have like a hundred thousand dollars. They could be paying like, what paying like probably like four or five hundred right. per generator. Right, because if you so, buy it in bulk, you get a better deal. Correct. Yeah, so, and they're essentially keeping our people in this kind of space so that we don't have public electricity and we have to buy these generators. Isn't that what people are saying? Like they're like controlling the electricity. Exactly, wow. and. My plan was was to help my family, but then I saw the bigger goal when I noticed that the issues that that um Haiti was having with power, and at the time there was a problem with like Jovenel Moise and Dimitri Volb, and I was still a little bit ignorant of what was going on, so I was like you know like maybe when I get to a large business commercial size, um, um in Haiti. Maybe I can like, you know, uh, start a power plant. Mm -hmm. Before I knew, you know, the powers that be and what can happen to me if I even try to attempt something like this. So well, that's a, yeah. that's a beautiful, very clean idea. Like, why import these hardware when you can start a power plant in IET? But is that really possible when they won't even allow you to 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 compete? <laughs> in the market yeah. so thank you so much now give me an idea i know it's a hard question but um what can mm -hmm. we do what 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 can be done so that someone like you who just wants to take care of their family and make them not dependent on your remittances that you're sending to them every month um but have a job um what can we do when they control the ports when they control the manufacturers and the shipping, how do we break this? I don't want to sound like an extremist, but um, you know, I'm a veteran also, and I've done my research. And um, okay, so I feel like there's three groups of people that's keeping Haiti hostage. The first one is the one that's co controlling everything, which would be the U.S. government. You know, and for Haiti, for uh, the U.S. government to control Haiti. They need to have certain people in the government and they have a actual party that controls pretty much everything as far as like Haiti does. Now they have another group of people, which is the oligarchs. They control pretty much everything that's coming into the country, you know, and they're controlling the, um, the banking system. So these three work together to keep Haiti impoverished and underdeveloped. That's right. Yeah. In my opinion, there's a way that we can uh, change this. It's going to be hard, but um, we would have to have certain people in government that can hold the oligarchs accountable for um, bringing drugs into the country. But before they do anything like this, they have to have allies, which would have, which probably would have to be from China and Russia. You know, they would have to get like some type of like military support from them. But that's going to be very difficult because this could be like a Ukraine 2.0. Right. And I don't have the answers, but but what I feel is that um that's the only way that we can combat this. But America would not let this go on without a fight. Yes. Yes. I don't have the answers either, but I do know that... Um... When Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines decided that it was time to stop 300 years of enslavement, they knew they had to get allies. Yes. They did. I mean, ultimately, we're facing this right now. The United States, it's, it's genocide for us. 
the gangs, the sexual violence, the rapes, it's, it's multi-generational trauma. That's what we have right now. It's, it's death that the U.S. has brought us. So um, there is going to come a point in time. There is, the, we are at the point in time where we're saying that we, this is not possible. We can't live like this. We want to control our economics. So the answer is that you got to get rid of the oligarchs and the way they do business. The United States has got to stop putting in puppets just because they're keeping us in poverty and living off of corruption whether it's at the customs houses or whether it's at the ports or whether it's just strong arming people. It's like a mafia. Um, but I think it's, it's exciting changes happening right now with the different alliances moving. Um, I thank you so much for um, giving us your experience, uh, Hans. And, uh, you know, we hope that those people that are listening understand um, that they can help us by talking to Washington about changing its policy. I mean, I don't think you guys listening to me from the United uh, for free speech want the United States to continue to kill essentially um, young men like this, for instance, who want to uh, uh, create an economic wealth and do it the right way, not in corruption. But do you want to kill that business or do you want to support that business so that you can support families and they could be self-reliant? Um, we That's what we want. We want U.S. policy that's going to support lo a local economy in IET. And, and, and that's what we're asking um, from the Free Haiti Movement. Uh, me and Hans are out here saying, listen, we want a local economy. Um, we want a local economy that helps the regular people of IET. And if you have connections with Washington, um, Hans just told you, we have three different levels of this imperialism. We have the puppet they put into power. We have the oligarchs that control all the economic doors. And then we have the United States that provide them with all of the diplomatic, military, and media power to keep a narrative going on as if we have a government right now when we have no judiciary, no legislature, all we have is a dictator put in by the United States. So I I um I thank you, Hans. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're just asking for those who are in solidarity in America can go to Washington and tell them to get their boots off our, ne our neck so we can breathe. Thank you very much. To say thank you everyone for having me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for supporting our work. Thank you for supporting. The United for Free Speech. I hope that uh, uh, my contribution is 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 um, uh, helps you understand a little bit about IT and the people who are running it and why um, things really need to change. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Senegas, Haiti.